Welcome, everybody, to the Kessler Edwards stream. Um, I'm your host, Petey Webb. I want to thank everybody for joining me this evening or this afternoon, wherever you may be located on the globe. Um, we're here to talk about Kessler Edwards with somebody that I'm uh, very excited to, uh, to, to bring to the stream. Um, that's Anish Nambury. Um, Anish, how are you doing today? Doing great. Um, hello, everyone. Appreciate you having me on, PD. Um, Sad you see me right before I get a haircut, but we move regardless. Excited to talk, Kessler. Yeah. Um, I uh, uh, thank you, Diligent Learner, for following. Um, uh, before we get started, I want to say uh, uh, thank you to anybody who, who donates to the Patreon, anybody who follows on here, um, anybody who's, who's liked and subscribed on YouTube. Those things are, are uh very helpful to allow me to keep doing content like this. I'm currently, you know, the only person who works on this though in time, I'd love to, you know, hire an editor to be able to get that faster, but those things definitely help. Um, uh, thank you, Selenio. Um, those things really help a lot. So with that, I would like to, um, uh, I, that. um uh, I would, uh, with that, I would like to, to move into the film. Um, Wanted did a touch. Besides of doing testing. And we're still moving. Okay, we don't have any problems. That's beautiful. All right, so the the, the five things I want to talk about today. First one is is uh, leveraging his really high-level gravity. Um, Kessler is a, a fairly legendary shooter, um, uh, especially, you know, considering his, his three-year career. But what's the next step? You know, yes, you can shoot, but how does that functionally work at an NBA level? Um, the second one is... Um, he has a, a unique jump shot. I think that's fair to say. Um, and I find his shot quality to be really high. Um, he doesn't take uh, like the, the JJ Redick running sideways jumpers or, you know, some of the shots that would be expected of very good shooters. Um, the, will that translate as his shot quality? Um, the next thing is, is, uh, physical thresholds for defensive role. Um, you can get a lot of different opinions on what position Kessler plays at, uh, at an NBA level. You could, some see him as a wing defender. Some see him as a defender of four. Some see him as, as a primary off ball defender, you know, sort of in the cell role. Um, and, um, and others, you know, sort of see him as a tweener between all those roles. And, and each one of those has a different physical threshold. Uh, the last one, or the, the fourth one is self-organization. Um, Kessler has some weird movement skills. Um, the, it's, it's sort of all over the place. And how he, how he develops uh, his, his ability to move better is going to be uh, essential. And then the final one is uh, skill development expectations. So uh, everybody has a, a different barometer on how they believe dribbling develops, how they believe passing develops. Um, and those are going to be important to to your own interpretation of Kessler. So, Anish, what of this sticks out to you most? Do you have any like immediate um, biases um, before we hop in? Um, not really. I think it's just important. Um, I'm sure that many people on here already know the the bias against Kessler's shot. Uh, I think it's important to take that out of context and instead look at the. Um, numbers and the sample and all that kind of stuff rather than the aesthetic bias you may or may not have towards it and then um just looking at yeah just looking at that mostly and then we'll get into the other stuff as as we get into the stream yeah um i think that i think that those are all um important points um and i think that he might be our most uh unique prospect in this class just for the uh, physical challenges and then how the eye test and the, the stats uh, interact with each other. Um, we're watching the, the BYU game. Um, here we, uh, BYU runs a, a motion and downscreen based offense. Here we're going to get a, a, a downscreen from Caleb Lohner um, while the weak side clears out. And you're, you can see that like Kessler has, I think, been raised as a four or a five and really knows how to fight through like off ball screens. He's able to, um, Keep Loner from um, from getting to this ball, um, uh, uh, denying him on the on the backside lob and fighting his way over to the front side. Um, 
I think that this is one of my favorite skills of his is his ability to be flexible in denial. Um, here you can see that like the ref doesn't have an angle on the scrab, so he's able to to hook with the with the weak side and fight around. Um, this is like he's he's not Vassell ability to to adjust on the uh, on the far side, but he's definitely um, uh, he's definitely good at closing down and redirecting space. Yeah, definitely agree. I think uh, coming off of that, I think one of his better abilities is to prevent um, different actions happening against smart players. And if you are not a if you're not reading that correctly, he will take advantage of it, even though he lacks in certain athletic tools. He's a smart enough defender from the positioning instincts, all that kind of stuff, where if you mess up, he will make you pay. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's definitely a, uh, a fair way of doing it. Um, the, uh, the next thing that I think I have to talk about is the jumper. I didn't include the, um, the uh, initial of the jumper. Are you tapping a little bit? Are you, are you tapping or something? No, I'm not. Okay. We're picking up a little bit of tapping. Let me just turn on uh, some of the noise suppression. Well, Folks, um, you know, uh, let's watch film heads have come to know it of it. Um, it is we've reached the um, small audio adjustment section of uh, of the pod. Um, so the jumper is strange, um, and it's strange in some specific ways. Um, it's it's mostly the lower body that is is unique and and I think that because there's some lower body deprivation um it makes the upper body do uh some uh, suboptimal things um so he's not always a hop shooter he is on this particular rep I think that it's his least comfort comfortable footwork pattern um and um and because he doesn't have like a quick release footwork pattern he gets shots off a little bit slower. Um, on the catch, there's a valgus collapse where we can see that, um, you know, the knees just collapse inward, stifling power generation. And then when he lands, as he's landing, he, he tilts, usually in, in almost like a lunge position um, with his hips tilted forward, his legs, one leg split forward, one leg split back. He is a 40% three-point shooter for basically his entire career. Um, but it can be difficult to rationalize like what you're seeing and, and what's actually like and, and the percentages. I think that that's why teams don't cover him as much is because they think that like he's not going to be like the the level of shooter that the stats say. Um, is that is that your intervention for some of these like weird closeouts he gets? Yeah, definitely. Like if you look at uh, Pepperdine's roster, it's in terms of offensive threats, it's basically Colby Ross and then him. Mm -hmm. And so just. If you think about like if you think about it at a high level, you should be like, okay, we'll uh, really, uh, really pressure Colby Ross, maybe even do like a one point five cover on him, and then we'll make sure that Kessler doesn't like any space to shoot because he can't really do much off the dribble, attack and closeouts, all that kind of stuff. But that's just not what happens. So that's probably the only explanation that I could think of as to why he had so many open shots. Yeah, um, I would I would compare Kessler's um, like his shooting issues to another like skinny guy that we had in last year's class, which would be Jaden McDaniels. Um, Jaden had a similar valgus collapse, had a similar issue with um, with uh, you know getting shots out quickly and, and generating power from his lower body. Um, at an NBA level, it was a little bit easier. Um, he he did make strides in getting stronger. But he still like has issues generating power from his, his posterior chain. Um, it's important to note that like while Jaden has uh, better ability to to release quickly, he's still not a fast release, and you can see the level of contest that he gets in the NBA. Where like the the NBA shooting windows are so small, and it's a thing that doesn't necessarily like show up until you see alternate angles. But like he's shooting into these like really tiny shooting windows, where if he were a half second slower. If his footwork were a little bit worse, um, he would have problems like getting this off. Like this might be a shot block or might be a, a deflection. 
Um, and that's a worry that I have with Kessler is is the type of uh, uh, is is how he's able to to generate power. Um, obviously, it reminds me a bit of, of Denny, who had um, who had some some real power generation issues at, at a younger age. They got sorted out, you know, in the in the three years between this two or three years between this shot and and uh, and his Wizards year. But we're we're seeing that these things are fixable. It's just a matter of of working through them, um, you know, but reorganizing the body, getting the the power um, the power movement as smoothly as possible. Um, there's there's quite a bit of of the Valgus collapse in Denny. There's a bit of the turn in Denny, and we can see those things represented in Kessler as well. They're not one to one because uh, Denny was a bit smoother energy transfer, but there are the same some similar concerns. Um, what did you think of the free throws? So, um, and I'm pretty sure you, uh, you're you going to also bring this up, but if you look at his lower body, the way I like to describe it in like an analogy is, you know, when you're doing like a double jump off a trampoline and so you like bend your legs, um, but you don't actually generate any power off of it. That's what his lower body looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's obviously not ideal. No, um, it is. It's pretty hard to find guys who put this much lower body. Um, into their shot like period like he's like almost jumping at the free throw line um and that speaks to both like how flat the jumper is but also like it's flat because he's doing so much of the runs um and i think that like calming that calming the the energy transfer will solve some like will solve some of the issues which are do not represented in the percentage they're represented in the availability so his shooting issues aren't the fact that he like you know is a 32% shooter. No, he's almost close to a 42% shooter. It's that he can't take some of the shots you would ideally want him to take because his body doesn't generate that energy the same. And like that's just not going to show up in a um in a broad statistical outline. And I think that's the that's the dissonance between like what your eyes see and what you know a cursory like Bartor Victor would show you. Yeah, and I, I think we'll um there's a there's a clip from this same BYU game where he tries taking a uh three out of a out of like a jab and he, he gets into like a deep lunge and when he pulls back and tries to shoot like it's it's so clear that he's really stretching his limits out of that lunge and that's the that's the kind of stuff that uh, i think you're talking about in terms of improving that energy transfer yeah so here we kind of see the the idea of him as a, a help side four um he he's denying over the top and closes out on loner um here we get good close out we have defined feet he's pushing him a certain direction and like you live with that shot 10 times out of 10 like you forced him into a, a a series of decisions um, that are dictated by the defense. Um, yeah, hundred percent. I I worry about teams actually testing that weak side, like just being like, okay, like block this shot ten times out of ten. Um, here we're gonna get um, some of some of Pepper Nine's offense. I think that. Kessler, the idea of Kessler is getting him on these flares, on these shakes to the weak side, on these hammer screens, but it's not necessarily something that shows up all the time. Like, I don't think he can really shoot that. Um, here we have, you know, an option. He can back cut this pressure or he can run towards the ball. And his priors as a big show up where he just, he posts out of these a lot and they turn into mid post, like, or, or like 18 foot post ups instead of being a back cut or a DHO into space. Um, he's good at ceiling, like for a skinny guy, he's definitely doing things. Um, did you, do you feel good about like the post passing in circumstances like this? Um, well, I think on this one, he actually jabs and then hits a three, I think. Yeah. But right? the, the, but the, yeah. but the pass is, is there. And like, there are different circumstances where his, um, his passing is like visible. Yeah, yeah, and especially if you look at his progression from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, he you could see him be more comfortable with the reads. I'm not sure if he improved with the processing, but mm -hmm. uh, he definitely got more comfortable making those. Uh, they love doubling him out of the post defenses in general, and so he there were it, early in the year he would just do the safe thing and kind of like dribble out or just do something that for sure wouldn't cut over. And then as the season went along, you could see him like trying a few things here and there, even though he saw it at both times. Yeah. Um, I think the defensive thing that I'm most interested in is his ability to, um, his ability to like fight around these screens. So like here we're going to, you know, uh, 
uh, run sort of a kitchen sink play that, that ends in uh, a, a DHO into a pick and roll. And Kessler two steps to get through the space, so the first one's a knife step, so exploding into it like a lunge, and then the second step is to get sideways around, so exploding over the screen and then fighting back um, to the middle. And he's able to reattach super easily. Um, and this is what makes the movement skill so intriguing. It's like, yes, he at times, like, you know, sort of has like this uh, like toddlerish run, but then he can also do these extremely difficult movement uh, skills where you can tell that he's, you know, been trained on technique and, and, and can get around difficult moments um, pretty easily. Yeah, and then you want to talk about this one first or do you want me to? No, no, feel free to, to, to lead on this one. So um, I think this is kind of like essence of the good and bad of Kessler on health D. Um, Obviously, we see the first one where he's chasing up the screen, but then we get this uh, baseline out of bounds play where he uh, is covering the interior of the paint well, is basically on time to guard harm, and he's right there to contest a shot. But you can it almost like he freezes and ends up making him ineffective on the on the contest, and that gets into his lack of pop and load time, which is um, especially if you're going to be like a help side four kind of guy. Um, that's something that will definitely need to be changed and yeah. fixed in terms of the movement. Yeah, his load up time is really, really long. Um, he's uncomfortable double jumping. I think part of it is that like he just wouldn't test well at it, but he just he wants to load up more. And I think that if he can load up quickly, he will be able to do a lot of these things. He does get these contests, and I think there's a real upside for it. But like he's the in in, in the NBA, you have to be so good at this. Look at Draymond. This is a one step vertical pop on a second jump. So he. He contests the first Boogie Cousins one, and then he's going. All he's going to have to do is land and take one step and pop back up. And that's how small these rim contest windows are from from um, from a help side position. Is if that technique is not perfect, you're getting banged on. Um, especially if yeah. you're not a guy with like a plus ten wingspan. Like it is so difficult. Um, so I think that like we have to keep in mind that like these skills are like are, are the thresholds for reaching them is really really small. You have to do so well. Um, and here we get another double, double jump from Draymond. Um, like Draymond is outlier, but we also have to realize that like, you don't have to be Draymond. Draymond is just the exemplar of this particular skill. Like yeah, feet are touching the ground, immediate, bad. immediate explosion back. Up. And like, maybe if you're at the 70 percentile, you get this block on Clint Capella, but it's, this is, these are the expectations of that role. For sure. And I think when you look at Draymond, it's, he doesn't, he's not like pausing to think about it because if you're in the NBA and even in college, you're seeing that for Kessler. If you think about it, it you're not going to be able to contest it, and that's going to be exacerbated in the NBA. So, it, it, it's or for someone who isn't a 70, even probably average NBA athlete, um, Kessler's really going to have to work on having the confidence to be like, okay, I see it, I got to jump now because if you think about it, you're done for. Yeah, um, and that shows up on on both sides, um, on on offense and on defense. Um, we'll we'll get to the the offensive section. He he loves to play out of these like seals, which he is very like he understands the angles of seals very well. Um, but if you get the ball in the seal, you have to be up just as quickly, uh, which we're starting to talk about in a moment. Um, he he likes a mid post fadeaway. Um, it's a concern that he doesn't get things that are easier all the time. Um, he, he, if I were just like grading on a plus minus system, the thing that would struggle be the most struggle for me would be getting up off the floor. Uh, I heard these a little bit wrong. Like Boucher is, is a, again, an, an outlier athlete, but just watching how quick his feet touch the floor to get like his opportunistic offense. If you're not going to be a guy who can score, um, um, creating for yourself, you have to score as an opportunistic scorer. And that is a world of surviving on the margins of quick timing. Yeah, definitely. I think there are uh, early in the year when I hadn't watched as much uh, Kessler, I was like, oh, he could be a small ball five kind of guy. But then after looking at it and seeing, like, if you compare him to Boucher, worlds of difference. And so if he has any shot of a small ball five, I don't think he does. But if he does want a chance at it, he's going to have to improve how how quickly he gets off the ground for those yeah. opportunity plays. And I think that he's also better suited to force because I guess a small ball five, it's much more difficult to do this kind of stuff. Um to um to like have a hard denial then have a reason denial, a third denial and like this turnover is not going to show up on his stat sheet but this is his turnover he 
basically breaks this place this play down, knowing that like a big is not necessarily going to be comfortable running DHOs. So he hard deny, then waits, then the ball comes again. It's a hard deny again, pushes over, and brings loner out of the play. Now we have a, an uncomfortable big without a dribble. That's his turnover. And I think if you play him as a small ball five, unless you're doing switch everything, which again is the hardest you know uh, defensive archetype to really find, um, you're going to have difficulties um, maximizing the things he is truly good at. Yeah, and that's uh, that play was the essence of one of his great, uh, in my opinion, one of his greatest micro skills is when he passes by the ball, he forces the, whoever has the ball, whether it be a big guard, whatever, to um, kind of pick the ball up and kind of reevaluate what they're doing and especially in those like when it's someone who isn't as comfortable with the ball it often results in either a reset takes them out of the offense turnover whatever you want to call it it's usually a positive play for Peppers. yeah um here we have some late clock um um we have some late clock uh situations defense is in a full set shape he's able to get one dribble down downhill and i feel like he um he does have some uh, ability to like do this kind of shot making it it's sort of essential for him to score at times downhill. I think that ended up getting uh, waved off. Um, but it is essential for um, for him to get these intermediary shots just because like rim self-created rim attempts are pretty sparse for him. Yeah, and I would even say not even self-created, but even um, off ball or it's not spare. Or it's not like rare, but it's not as common as you would think initially. Yeah. Um, so here he's going to, you know, he's, he's shading to, to prevent the, um, to prevent the, the high low. Um, so all his energy is on that. And he just forgets that like Loner still has a dribble. Loner puts a, a, a shoulder into him and finishes with the left. Um, I think that, uh, uh, Kessler has a, like a, what do we say? Like a plus five wingspan. It's long, but these are the moments where that, that pop hurts him like, um, a longer defender or a more poppy defender. Um, probably gets this block, but he's also that and, you know, able to be knocked off his spots by, um, by, def by, by stronger, stronger players. Like why this is essential is like, this is an archetype is that having the ability to hold, um, hold up, I got to pause this. I'm getting a lot of clicking from you. Is there, are you, are you typing or anything or like, there's a, nah, there's some, it I, sounds I, like I got my, almost. Popcorn? No, no, I got my hands in my size. I'm, oh, I'm not doing anything. Okay, yeah, I'll just fix it in post. No worries about it. I was just trying to figure out if there was some uh, environmental thing that, that we could solve real quick. Um, yeah. So um, why this strength level is so important is that um, is that this is an essential defensive archetype. Being having the ability to to shove players off of spots allows for a certain type of coverage, which is that you can overload on one side and push star defenders or you know uh, players who you will never stop you just simply want to encourage them to take worse shots um so like here we have an overload to to the the middle miami can live with whatever on that weak side because there's going to be a blind double and crowder is strong enough to um crowder is strong enough to to push Giannis into this fadeaway a shot that miami will live with because now they're in you know a perfect rebounding shape and he airballs it and and you get more than a shot you want, but it's just, can you hold strong enough to discourage offensive players from getting to spots? Here we're going to see Wiggins doing essentially the same thing. Jimmy, he's strong enough to, to guide Jimmy out of the paint. And, and because he's able to strong enough to guide Jimmy out of the paint, there's, we're going to be in perfect rebounding position to end a possession. And I have concerns for Kessler on both sides of this. Of will he be strong enough to, to prevent... Um, prevent these issues and, uh, on defense, and will he be strong enough to overcome these type of defenders on offense? So when I see something like this, it's, it's, a, it's an offensive clip, but it, it also represents part of his solving his defensive archetype or, or figuring out what the pathway forward is for him on defense. It's like, I might be more comfortable with him guarding like smalls than NBA threes, fours, and fives right now. Yeah, that's definitely something that was a takeaway for me after my deep dive. I think I watched six games of his this season. And like, if... Is Caleb Loner is like a semi fringe, interesting NBA prospect. But if he's bowling you consistently, and Anton was doing that uh, against Gonzaga, uh, he's in for a rude awakening in the NBA. Yeah, uh, I would say this ability to not get burned on digs is a is a testament to his defensive rotational ability. Um, he consistently gets he consistently gets two spots um, on defense where he like even if the defender even if the the ball handler passes out. Um, 
there's just not a way that they can hurt him. Like he he stabs here, and he's still able to know that like okay, there's one there's only one patch that's gonna happen, and I can. Um, and that's really impressive. Um, it's really impressive to, um, be able to to get to that kind of spot, to be able to to recognize like this is what's essential. Um, so I I think that we are are talking about um a. Sorry, let me rewind that real quick. So I walk through it. Like we're talking about a rotational plus defender, um, who does have these these uh, spatial abilities because he also closes out in a way that like Lunar's a- attack attempt is not going to work. Like he's pushing him where the defense is most comfortable and able to then flatten him out and take a charge, just whatever. But it's it's the work. It's the ability to stab, recover, and then once he's recovered, be in a position where be in a position where the, the the ball handler can't like is doing the the attack of least scare the least worrying attack possible yeah yeah and takeaways is how good he is that i call it like a you call it a stab i call it like a stutter stunt um where it's just like a quick jab in and then popping out and that like I said, anytime there's a ball handler at whatever level, it's going to at least make him think for, unless you're like super, super elite. Yeah. I mean, like OG is, is like the, I would say one of the gold standards of this. Um, one of the things that also like, so like one of the, the places that pot, his pop is also going to show up is, um, is, is in pick and roll coverage. Um, he is really good at understanding where he like needs to be but he also isn't able to like he's not blocking these closeouts in the way that like of itself might um uh, uh, a bridges might like his archetype is very different than them because they were sort of like basketball psychics and he's just simply a very good positional defender and he's not fully disruptive he's just like very good at uh, discouraging rather than destroying, and that has value. It just it is also a, a form of ceiling. Yeah, that's that's my big thing with him as well. I believe this is your jab and jumper. Um, oh no, this is the pass. Okay, so here we get a uh, yeah. a, a, a a guard post up. Five defenders all keyed on him in good shape. Swings like he he understands the shape and the balls out quickly. Um. To me, this is just understanding like where a defense is going to be, not necessarily a read. It's like the read's already been made. No, no defenders looking at at uh, at man and ball, so it's, the ball just has to be out quick because you're getting so much attention. Yeah, and like I mentioned before, that's something he he wasn't doing um, early in the year, and he has gotten better. Um, some people might see it as a bit more playmaking flashes. Um, I still think he's a bit more uh, of a ball mover because that seems like something that was coached into him. That's just my guess. Obviously, don't have really any intel around that, but yeah. Um, so this is this is sort of your ideal playmaking spot. If you if you are a an elite disruptive defender, is is this role two on one where you have the responsibility for the roller? You also have you know a, a responsibility for the closeout. Um, and he does his job. He gets the closeout he wants. This play should be over, but he's not able to hold Loner on that baseline. Loner does drop step and is able to get to the cup. Um, like Iguodala is again, uh, about as good as you can get. If you get to this position where you're, if where the ball handler has to change direction and there's any kind of help, that's a win. There can be a strip, there could be a block. That doesn't matter. This is, this by itself is a win. And I found myself, I, I found in this tape that Kessler can struggle to hold defenders in those positions. He can struggle to, um, get defenders to flat even. Yeah, if you look at uh, Kessler versus Iguodala, um, you can see Kessler's foot completely drop back, whereas mm-hmm. Iguodala barely anything, if at all. Yeah, and I, I think that this is also just a function of strength. Um, and like what happens in the NBA, if you miss these sorts of things, is that like even if you're a small bit off, like this doesn't seem like a, a one-to-one play, but just like if you're a little bit off on a rotation, if you give up a little bit of baseline, if you give up a little bit of oh, like I thought I could reach this and I couldn't, um, it ends really poorly. Um, that's just like that is a extremely uh, dangerous game to play. Is is help side gambler, but like help side gambler within the rotational. Like 
here to resist again. He doesn't get even. Kessler, uh, you know, does not seal that position and isn't able to hold it because of strength level. Um, here we're going to get another DHO. We're going to clear out on the weak side. Um, uh, I think this is an under, and that we are going to get. Um, like he, BYU's offense is very flow based, so now we're flowing to the second side, and we have dual responsibilities now. Um, they're lifting, um, they're they're lifting loner to try to get this this empty side pick and roll look. They get it. Kessler reads it. He's there before he needs to be. Like again, his ability to read these rotations is very very good, but it's not like in in the like playmaking sense. He's just exactly where you would want to be if you were you know doing film. This is perfect relational defending. He's there on time. Defender doesn't see him, and, and it's a point. Um, my concern is that like you have to be a little bit more quick twitch to do this in the league to, to be able to be in position. Um, like again, Jonathan Isaac is uh, I would say the best at leaving the floor second of uh, among guys in the league. Like he really waits until the last possible second and is able to uh, punch it once or or make his challenge once the 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 big has declared their or the shooter has declared their spot. So we get a stunt, we wait, then once Luca extends the ball fully, exposing it the most, it's over the top to punch it. Um, and I don't necessarily know if Kessler is ever going to be able to, like, I think it's already like nine and a half feet in the air, and, and Isaac is still on the floor. And, like, these are the types of, to be the level of impact that I think Kessler needs to be to, to warrant how high I would like to have him, which, like, is almost a lottery prospect. Um he has to have these particular areas where he can recover once he's put put defenders or put offensive players in spots where they can or plays can be made. Like he's good at getting them there, but he's not always good at, at keeping them there. And like you said, uh, Isaac is one of the best uh, defenders when he's jumping second. I Kessler barely already wins when he jumps with them. Mm -hmm. And so imagine what's going to happen at the NBA in college and imagine what's going to happen at the NBA level, which yeah. I'm a little bit higher in if he can improve that or like that he can improve that, but it's definitely a concern that needs yeah. to be addressed. Yeah. I'm not saying that like, I don't think he can improve it. It's just to me, the goal, my goal for this series is to, to make these things crystalline to be like, this is the thing that if I were evaluating this prospect would be my entire focus. And so like yeah. this reactive athleticism to me is an essential piece of, of his evaluation and that it would be one of the swing pieces of it. Like, because um, he's much more set prospect. Like, you know, we have guys where there's like, like, like Rocco, where there's like a million different things that could happen. But with Kessler, because he's so much more set, like it, it allows you to laser in on like, this is the thing that would determine if you have him as a late first or a lottery guy, or this would be the thing that, you know, makes him a guy in the forties or a guy in the twenties. Um, and I find that fascinating, but to me, that that ability to make plays when jumping second, when you know having to react, that reactive athleticism is an essential piece. This is the dig. Um, this is a yeah. this is just a small thing I love. Uh, you want to talk about uh, your love for two handed digs? Yeah, and uh, this is kind of an offshoot of what I was talking about in terms of him when he passes the ball. He, for, like, um, two-handed dig completely makes, uh, I think his name is something Ward, uh, Warward? Warward, I think. Um, but, like, that completely makes him shift his focus, allows the defense to get set, and it's just it's his ability to affect the ball handler, uh, especially mm -hmm. when they're stationary, um, and really force an adjustment is something special and also not be completely out of position on his man because the quick just little flash uh forces the defense to stop what they're doing adjust what they're doing whatever you want to call it and then uh go to a counter in most cases while still maintaining defensive health integrity is is really high level yeah the other like small secret is that like two-handed digs never get called like it's just refs do not call two handed digs foul. So if you reach in with two and you're strong enough to either disturb the rhythm of the ball handler or to get the ball itself, um, you are. It is a, a a sort of loophole in the rules that lets you be a more disruptive defender. And that's a thing I really like from him as well. He isn't like the the strongest in terms of core strength and the ability to to do energy translation. Um, he is very good at timing his two handed digs and able to like disrupt ball handlers far more than he should have. 
um which like i think is 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 a thing that like usually stronger guys are able to do but when skinnier guys understand like oh the rules are tilted towards two-handed digs um like you can still do one-handed digs but it's just it's so much more timing based like you have to wait until the ball gets exposed you have to uh, you're at risk that like some reps will see this swing downward motion and just call a foul no matter what. Um, where with two handed digs, you're able to to swipe in um, and and really make a difference. And like if you're good at it, you're good at it. But two handed digs are a thing that I've just always been a uh, a huge fan of just as a concept. And it's a thing seeing Kessler do makes me really happy to to see that maybe it'll catch on as a uh, a a hack for future defense. Yeah, and uh, at the risk of saying the obvious. Two, two handed digs, you have a much better, especially when you have Kessler saying snakes, you have a much better chance of creating, knocking the ball loose, whatever, just because two hands versus one, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then we have the finishing. Um, so here he gets to an okay spot. The, the big in front is not going to challenge. They're just, uh, you know, they're, they're doing the phantom, present a body and fade away to, to go box out. And Kessler gets walked towards the baseline um, instead of exploding up and out. So again, that, that explosive uh, athleticism strength level to to hold a position he gets to an interesting spot he he's able to use long strides and his jabs but he makes the shot more difficult for himself because his last step is baseline versus towards the ball. yeah and pd have you noticed when he jabs it's always so example uh, if he's jabbing with his left foot the left foot will then go right and he'll always like cross his feet rather than some people they'll jab and then go the same direction as their jab. Kessler, I don't think I ever saw him jab and go the same direction. It's always going to be going, which also doesn't help in that instance. I think it's a power generation thing. That's my interpretation of it. That, like, because it's in more of a lunge stance, it's easier. Um, okay. Here we're going to get some uh, some pick and pop. So this is going to be a huge show. Just, uh, you know, out to almost half court. And then he's going to close out to the pick and pop. Um, which... Uh, is like this is a, a this is sort of why the mobility is so interesting is that he can do these really intense mobility things but then he also has problems so you know he closes out this huge gap prevents loner from getting a a pretty good looking shot of the three and then he just isn't enough to to get he's not uh, reactive enough to get a deflection on the second one which i think is like a much easier play and this is why you know athleticism is a spectrum and athleticism is situational because like that's hard that 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 recovery after that is hard and this is what you think would be easy because this is a pretty gettable pass and it's just it's not uh as universal as you think here's here's the jumper you you can see how slow this this develops we have the, the lunge footwork again i can't emphasize how good of a shooter he is and i think a lot of people do get turned off just because it, it looks funny and it's it's slow to come out of his hands yeah, and then uh, just a quick touch back on that last play. When he jumps back on Loner, when uh, Loner, you can see the lack of core stability because he kind of like, he has to like recenter himself because he's kind of wobbling on his uh, on his tiptoes. Yeah, I mean, and, and we've talked about it a lot, but like jumping backwards is, a, uh, is an extremely difficult physical thing to do when you're backpedaling, jumping backwards. It's, it's just not easy. Um, do you believe he's a two, a, a hop shooter, or a one, two shooter? What is your general belief on the, the best pathway forward for him as a shooter to get shots off at a higher clip in the NBA? I think it's pretty clearly a one, two shooter. He just doesn't seem comfortable with that. And because of the level of shooter he is, I'd be like, all right, you're a one, two shooter. That's fine. You're, you seem comfortable with it. You're a good shooter. We'll, we'll work with that. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the difficulties that, that I have is just like the shots he's going to get are going to be so much harder in the league. And like, I, I think about somebody like Ryan Anderson who like basically took um, uh, a, an amount of shots commensurate with his shooting ability. And because of that, like at a certain point, you know, there's not enough easy jumpers. So you have to start taking the harder ones and it, math does shake out. But like the shot quality that Anderson got, even in Houston, even you know, later in his career, he was still taking Difficult shots, whether they be for range or from challenge. And I'm concerned that Kessler can hold the percentages on the volume I would like him to take, which is like he shot, I think he had a 35, 36% or 36 uh, three point rate. And that's just not enough. Like if you're a 40% shooter, you need to be getting, you know, higher than your percentage for your attempt rate. 
yeah it's, it's like that one it's like that one thing if you're shooting like what i think it's like if you're shooting over four net from three you should be shooting more kind of thing yeah i mean if you're a good shooter there's almost no limit on how many threes you should be taking um if you can get a, a reasonable quality um like here we get some some spain out of a, an empty side and like that's drew holiday closing out this is an this is an insanely hard shot with negative momentum and the only person that you would want to take it is somebody who is an elite shooter, which I believe Kessler to be, but he has some limitations and there has to be an ability to square that circle. There has to be an ability to, to say, like, you're an elite shooter, so we want you to take elite shooter shots, but do you have the footwork and, and release speed to take those shots in games at a, in high leverage situations? And that, yeah. that's, the, that's the crux of the evaluation for me is, is, is for him as a shooter is, like, can you take that negative momentum going to your left off a hop with an elite contest in your face? Yeah, and to be clear, just I, I, I don't know how com like how comfortable he can get with the hop, but that's just the the one two is just something I start with, and then um, as you can as you kind of get him in your system, have a, have him first couple years in the league, whatever you can kind of figure out how much shot uh, shot versatility, diversity in terms of uh, footwork. He does have. Yeah. Here we're gonna get some more digs. Um, we are. Uh, we're gonna see that that um, that he is very capable of just disturbing ball handlers with with his ability to show up, so stab and recover. And because of the stab, the guard is able. I think it's Kobe is able to to fight around and like. Is so distracted with the with the stutter with the stunt that he doesn't worry about getting blindsided. It's not Kobe, um, and that's that's the level of disruption that I'd like to see. The difficulty is it's obviously like getting to a place where that's valuable because if you're that's your first defender, like you don't really want them off ball that much. If that's your second defender, that's still a difficult archetype. Like I I think his best circumstance is both a third and fourth option on offense and defense, um, and that's a connecting player who has value, but it's also like. Those are generally only on good teams. That's valid. Um, here we have a seal that gets broken up. They they run a pretty interesting seal. Um, uh, quick header out of Loopy that you know it's Loopy into a or floppy into a DHO. Um, and then they they send Colby the opposite way. Once Colby goes the opposite way, um, Kessler seals and he he a lot of his usage comes from these post entries. Like he wants to operate out of there, and I just don't think that's going to be a viable usage type. Like to the point that like maybe five percent of the time in the league versus I would say it's most of his uh, self created um, shots in in college. In the NBA level, unless there's like major strength transformation. Yeah, and this clip right here, like he he, I think uh, it's a fine looking shot. Uh, off the off the pull up, but my bigger issue is he doesn't take the first one. The first one is the shot I would love for him to take. You have a downhill shake out of a pick and roll. Like this is the thing that would terrify a team. You want to help off onto this pick and roll at all? Jumper goes up. But I don't think that he's comfortable taking that quick of a trigger where he he can. And I think that the idea of him as a shooter um, isn't as leveraged because teams know that he won't take these these somewhat contested ones or these. Uh, uh, unclean shots. Um, here we just get a, a bad switch. I think that he is better on guards, but he does still have movement um, issues. He's hip to hip and uh, and and pushing the the guard into a, a pretty difficult attempt. He crosses his feet, and that allows to get enough separation for the guard to go to the weak side. Um, he has some okay recovery moments, but it's the same athleticism um, concerns where he's not going to cover huge ground in recovery. Just doesn't have the pop for it. He's much more comfortable. Funneling, um, funneling players and, and blocking shots from a, a position of blindness than, than just uh, athleting. Yeah, we were talking about this with a uh, former stream guest, Spencer C. Francis, uh, yesterday. Because like he he's got to be on on the right timing on defense. Because if he be, I'm not sure if I trust him to recover. Yeah, um, this is this is the jab that that you were talking about. Why jab out of a lunge? He gets a lot of movement out of it, but he's not able to, to leverage it. And the second half of the jumper, it's just his body. Like his upper body is the only thing shooting it. His legs uh, aren't connecting, which which leads to some problems. Um, here, I believe we're, they're going to isolate to get harms in the post. Um, uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's another it's another uh, you know flow to run a really simple action. So they're going to just clear out this weak side with 
sort of a, a fake hammer and um and this is a this this is you know the the thing that we talked about like if you're a defensive playmaker um you should love handling the back line and the the opposite side is there to to cover and he just does his job rather than going out of position it's sort of like the re- reverse matisse thibel like matisse abandons scheme to do his own thing and at times i feel like kessler doesn't abandon scheme enough and that i want him to take more risks as yeah, a uh, like, go ahead my bad uh yeah like uh matisse for example would be on the left block kessler's mm-hmm. on the right block and then the happy medium is being straight under the hoop yeah i i think that it's just trusting the scheme to get stops more versus like deciding that he needs to make a play. Um, and that's fine. I just wish that he had a little bit more uh, risk taking in how he approached help side defense. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean the landing is is a concern, but I think the the ma- one of the bigger things is uh is just that the angle he takes towards the rim um on this catch is not Oh, this is the isolation. No, no, this is this is the one I really wanted to talk about. Um the other one, yeah, the landing is is not great. There's somebody who slides underneath him. Um I understand the landing, he doesn't take a good angle. This one is interesting. So, it is uh you just rewind it, and you see he gets kind of bumped out. He gets he's wide, tough, just not a good. Thing. I think his ankle gets caught up. I don't think it's very standardized. This is another one of those like, hey, I would really love it if you shot it. Um, attempts, or there's going to be a, um, there's just going to be an opportunity that that isn't there for him. Like that would be there for him if he shot faster. Um, yeah, that, that there's an angle there. Oh, I don't love it. Um, so it's going to be a pick and pop. Right, they're on a hawk action, um, which is back screen and then pick and roll, and they're gonna turn into a pick and pop. And like this is the thing he should live on. Um, he should be absolutely feasting on these pick and pop actions. And he just doesn't, and in the NBA there's only so much advantage you're going to get. And if you're a shooter, you need to seize on what you get, and it leads to, you know, this sort of post hook, which is fine. Like it's an okay shot. It's just that like instead of stick like shooting through a suboptimal strength, he went into a okay weakness. Like an okay shot for his weaknesses. And I would just like to see more of tilting towards his game to to tough uh knockdown threes. Um it also asks like what happens when teams close him out? Like if you get yeah. bad closeouts, how do you how do you thrive? And that is that that's a concern for him because he if you close him out hard, there's not a guarantee that he's going to make your your uh defense pay. And I think the teams are just gonna continue to to close out hard enough that he doesn't want to shoot contested jumpers. And I don't know if there is a a clean uh, solution for him because he's not super comfortable like sidestepping or or you know half close out step back, um, and he's not you know fantastic at, at space aiding into these things. So it's it's a concern about like I think teams might be a little bit too comfortable closing out on him pretty hard, um, which is its own sort of problem. Yeah, and it's it's not that I would uh, like I would actually guarantee that like. Teams are like teams are gonna close hard on that, close out hard on him. Excuse me, because they just they're like, all right, you're not gonna get to the basket, and even if you do, we'll have a, we'll have someone there on help, and uh, you're not gonna be able to finish. Yeah, I mean, J Max a, a good uh, a counterpoint where you like J Max again, not skinny. I would say like has pretty severe biomechanical issues, but he's still able to put his shoulder low. He's able to get low, and like even if the solution isn't there. The process is solid. We're like, if you close out hard, he's going to try to punish it. Um, and I just didn't feel like there was an optimized solution for um, uh, for Kessler on these types of circumstances where he teams would close out and there wasn't the punishment I was hoping for. Yeah. Um, I think that, that the other reason why teams will be pretty comfortable closing out on him is that like his quick decision passing isn't always there. So this is a spin. This is a hard pass. But we have a two-on-one weak side if the big helps over. So, like, if the big steps up, you don't even necessarily have to finish this. So, you know, go to the corner, go to the drop-off. And instead, he tries to, you know, finish it himself, which is, you know, I think a fine solution. The big is in perfect position. But just that you have to punish teams for whatever coverage they're giving you. 
and saying like you can't make the same read every single time and i just felt like there was a little too much comfort with that yeah and i think i think the the drop off big could have sealed a little bit better to make that pass easier but that should be it i don't think he even like considered that read which is hmm. it which if let's say if i was a big that would be what i would be looking at first yeah um and and here we're going to get you know a an empty side pick and roll over the top and it, it, a foul gets called, but I just don't feel like this is enough aggression considering the circumstance. You, if you, you can always get to this X out if you really need to um, with Kobe taking the, the corner, you just have to make sure that like this pass can't get there comfortably and does enough that, that, that a foul is called. Like it should have been much more difficult. He should have gambled harder on that entry. Like, he has the ability to close down these bases because of his movement skills. And he's just not able of capitalizing on them right now, whether that's a trust, an over trust in the scheme or an under trust in his own ability to close down space. Um, yeah. So um, after, you know, uh, spending a little bit of time, you know, about 40 minutes with, with this film, what did any of these jump out on, um, on, on a rewatch? Um, any of these are you're more or slightly less concerned about, um what what jumped out to you um i would definitely say the uh the shooting the the shot quality kind of thing is the thing that i want to take uh probably an, a, another look at uh if i have time just i was like okay he's a good shooter even though the mechanics are weird and he'll be fine but then yeah you made a great point in pointing out like he's that good of a shooter he should be he's probably gonna have to take um more or types of difficult shots to really maximize that ability and uh he's just so one track mind like so many of his shots are either like two-step relocations wide open catch and shoot like they're, they're very easy shots and so rarely do you get those shots in the nba yeah um it's i think that's that's the one that jumps out to me is uh is on offense is it's just is hunting more shots um, and then on, I think on the other end, the thing that I was more bullish on when I came in was um, the physical de- thresholds of his defensive role. Like I thought of him as a player who could pretty easily slide between multiple positions defensively. And now I think that that is more fraught. I think that long term, it's still going to be true because like I, I just want to bet on guys who have such a high level of scheme understanding. But I think that part of being so good rotationally isn't just doing your job. It's if you're going to be a small, smaller minutes player, it's making things happen. And I just want to see him turn the aggressiveness on his own understanding of things all the way up. Um, I think that that's the, the most important one for me. Um, so I'm going to, to take a quick uh, one minute break and, and we'll be right back. If you guys want to uh, use some questions real quick. Um, we can come back to finish out with, with 15, 20 minutes of Q&A, and we'll get on out of here. Um, I'll see you guys in a few. One. All right, all right. Just doing a, uh, a quick audio check. How am I sounding? Um, I went through and tried to fix Scout Me, so it should be working again. If anybody wants to try. Um, I turned it from subscribers, moderators, and me to anyone. So if you want to give that a shot. Nisha, are you sounding? Uh, I think I'm good. Okay. Right. Chat, we get a confirmation right. on whether he's good or not. Okay. So the uh, the first question we have is, how do you feel, this is from Ira If how do you feel about Kessler versus Trey Murphy? I feel like that's a huge debate on draft Twitter, more, maybe less so now. Uh, do you want me to answer first? Yeah. Um, I think they are, in theory, similar uh, types of players. It's just, um, I would say Murphy is a bit more aesthetically pleasing, but I would say Kessler is, I guess, a little bit smarter as a defender. Um, I think Trey, Mur- uh, I think Trey Murphy's a, a decent bit more versatile as a shooter, and obviously the percentages are, uh, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but relatively similar um but yeah i haven't i haven't done my trey murphy deep dive but basically i would trust uh, trey murphy as a shooter um kessler's instincts are better but then uh, i would say 
uh, trademarking moves a, moves a bit easier. Yeah, I mean, that's that's roughly in line. I think that um, I have worries about how trademark. I think that we're getting the Virginia backlash that we got the Texas Tech backlash, backlash like three years ago, where like, that defensive scheme has its internal benefits that are hard to parse out. And I think that I trust Kessler a little bit more defensively, um, making his own read. Um, but I think Trey Murphy's jumper is going to be less difficulties. So I think that for teams that maybe have less faith in their own shooting development or shooting development as a philosophy um, are going to be a little bit more, or will lean Trey Murphy. Yeah, and I was saying that in a general sense because I have Kessler about 10 spots higher, but yeah. Um, okay, uh, Sawyer asks, so... It's like he needs more confidence slash freedom on both ends of the court with the shot selection and help defense. Shouldn't his some time in the G League during his rookie season help that out? Uh, you reckon? Yeah, I think I think it's more. Um, actually, yeah, you go first. Um, yes, I think that that's pretty essential. Um, he's been a uh, a guy who is. Um, who has like played in a, a defensive system for, um, for like almost his, you know, he played at, 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 Awant, at Awant in high school and at Pepperdine here. I think that he's just been taught to trust the system a little too much and playing in a, uh, alternative environment is going to be really important for him. Um, so that is, I think the, the most essential thing for me is just getting into a place where like the rules are very different, seeing how he adapts to that. Um, he'd also be a guy I'd be really interested in seeing how they handle um, like pre-draft and like some of the the, the pre-draft games and stuff because like I think that he has a game that um, I'd be really interested in seeing in like the, the pretty loose pickup game style. Um, how do you feel about that one? Um, yeah, I would say definitely G League because like if you just ask in the NBA early, early if he gets on the court early on, it's going to be to shoot and uh, keep the team defense at a like, not be like a ceiling guy, but a floor raiser um, mm-hmm. in the in that second unit. And I don't know if you just keep him like that for whatever his his whole rookie contract. I don't know what kind of upside that brings. Um, so I would love to have him in a in different um, in different settings where he can actually see what his athletic limitations are and kind of be like, oh, this is where I need to improve and kind of bring that, kind of bring that into his mind. I'm not saying he doesn't know that, but it, it's always helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's very important to see people in different contexts, and he's been, I would say, a, a pretty similar context, which is a, a context of minimizing risk um, for, you know, going on almost seven years now, six, seven years. Um, so. The, the G League, where uh, I would say risk is encouraged um, for young players, it would be really essential. Um, the next question we have is uh, it's from Hoop Goose, who asks, would Kessler be better off in a motion heavy offense or more of a he- heliocentric high pick and roll guy? Um, do you want to handle this one first? Um, I would definitely stay in more of a heliocentric high pick and roll type just because I don't. Right now, as of off the bat, I don't trust him to really attack off of closeouts and capitalize off of that. And I don't think he has enough self creation where he can attack in advantage situations and all that kind of stuff. So, just basically being like a uh, a standstill shooter where if you help off of him, um, for example, your ball handler is going to pass to him and he's going to shoot and he's going to make it at a high 30s, probably, um, percent clip on decent volume, I think is the way to go initially. Yeah, I think that I would want him in a heliocentric when he's younger with the idea of building towards a lineup and a development where he is a motion-heavy player. I just don't think that's right now. Um, So I think that he has uh, very clear upsides that you could maximize in a heliocentric system. And, like, again, the more heli... the (laughs) Being heliocentric means that you already have a lot of your team already figured out, so he's probably going to click in easier, where... In a more motion style system, things are going to be a little unsettled, and I would simply just want, um, I would simply just want him in a, a place where things are simple as you start to build out the, um, um, uh, the the secondary skills. I think that for people who are higher on his passing, they would probably say the inverse. Um, 
I'm a little lower on it. I think that he makes good reads, but he's not necessarily somebody I want making a ton of them. Yeah, I I I agree. I don't. I'm not very high on his uh, his playmaking, or yeah, I'm not high on his ball ball movement, but not playing. Uh, Francis asks, would you be comfortable running scarce post ups for Kessler versus Smalls? You or me to start? I mean, if you have a if you have a strong one. I mean, I I, I feel like uh, you know where I'm coming from. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm guessing PD is a no, and I'm a no as well. Um, he's gonna need. Uh, a decent amount of strength training improvement, whatever you want to call it before he can do that. I think that it's somewhat similar to Denny in that like his most comfortable reads are versus are in post-ups and you have to figure out a way of, of replicating those same defensive looks that he can internalize the reads that he reads that he has already built up. And I think that you can do that by running like pick and rolls that are ghosted to the corner because that's essentially the same defensive setup. Um, so I would be more comfortable running those types of actions where he can get essentially the same type of defensive shape that he can read um, rather than having him post up because I just think that most teams are going to live with it and that most guards are strong enough and have a low enough center of gravity to really um, bother him. But I just think that it's the question is like, how much do you believe in that turnaround um, uh, fade away? Because that's his, his go to post move. Yeah, I, I would prefer that he didn't take many of those in the NBA, especially yeah. early on. Um, does Kessler's jumper remind you of uh, Jaron Jackson's Jr.'s jumper aesthetically? In um, the way that they're both kind of weird, yes, but outside of that, not really. Pete, you can go a little bit. Yeah, I think that, that I think that they're, um, this is one of those, like, uh, all good, uh, all good looking jumpers are the same and all, like, bad looking jumpers are, are unique. Um, not to say that, like again, I'm a huge like it just it looks odd and so they're they're correlated, but like Jaron's lower body didn't do anything like this. Like Jaron's issue is that like his legs sort of like didn't bend, if I remember correctly. And he just like flicked it. Um the other thing is like Jaron had a super quick trigger. And I think that in getting to the next question that we're gonna talk about, um, which is from Robel, is the tendency to only take good looks from three a wiring issue or an inability. Um, I think that it's a learned behavior. So I think that it's um the difficulty of of getting shots off like probably under heavier contests or heavy pressure and so he's simply just like faded away he's he's been conditioned out of it of like oh i I can't get this shot off um and like i think that some of that is also the like pepperdine was a little bit more conservative with uh with his shot selection than than i probably would have encouraged but i mean that's that's a that's a nitpick from a developmental perspective um yeah uh, so I think that I think, I think that the inability leads to the wiring issue, if that makes sense. Like the it's not chicken or egg. It's that one causes the other because it was probably like the the taking rougher looks, probably especially like in uh, in high school or early in his Pepperdine career looked worse. And so that's sort of been conditioned to be like, well, then just hunt good shots. OK, never mind. Yeah, you, you covered what I was going to say. I'm still here. Uh, Vic Vinegar asks, does Kessler fit better in hedge or drop? Uh, hedge, easily. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he's a big for me. So, like, it's, I, I'm treating him essentially as a perimeter prospect, uh, unless you have a five who, um, really does some specific things. Um, I think that that goes to a question that we got a little bit earlier, um, which is, uh, so from Sawyer, question. yeah, which is what would be an ideal front court pairing for Kessler, and what team situations would be best for his development slash success? Okay, can I uh, take this really yes. quickly because I have like a I told you earlier that I have something I wanted to point out. So, um, part of my team building philosophy is I think the most ideal way to have it is have your um, primary offensive players um, be in be the guys doing the in help position mostly, and then have your lower usage offensive players as more the point of attack defenders. But Kessler is a little bit opposite where I think he should be uh, paired with, for example, someone like Jalen Brown who can cover, or Draymond Green who can cover the point of attack stuff and then have him off ball. And PD, do you want to go into um, what kind of teams are best? I touched on two, obviously. Yeah. Um... So I have some fun names um, that I think would 
from from my perspective, I'm I'm more thinking about maximization. Um and I guess I, I assume that this draft is going to be the most trade filled draft in a long time. Um because there's so many different evaluations on this class outside of like the top four generally. And so I think teams are gonna move all over the place. So like um some names that jumped out to me um would be like Golden State, uh New Orleans. Um, I can hear a case for Atlanta. Um, and what is, oh, and then uh, I think Denver is another uh, one I find very interesting, which is just trying to have a lot of decisions either made for him or to to slim his role down to the things that he's excellent at um, with the idea of building towards it. Um, I think that you can sort of see where my brain is at with his idea uh, of like you know the the ideas of, of of Ryan Anderson, um, and like that sort of shot selection in those ideas, and also like just getting teams where he's going to get as many easy shots as possible to to build a baseline of playing time so that he will develop going forward. I mean, it feels like cheating to say you know the Raptors, but like I think that's also a developmental system that would probably work pretty well for him. Um, thank you for the question. Um. Um, and then just another thing, uh, a couple teams that I also looked at uh, were Sacramento, New York, and Washington. But the issue with that is um, they have prospects that also will probably get the uh, priority over him that he doesn't pair well with. Sacramento, it's Marvin Bagley. Uh, New York, it's Obi Toppin. Washington, it's Rui. Um, so I would be interested, but those people probably take higher priority, and they probably would not be moved to get Kessler. Uh, in the event that Kessler does get drafted. So that's how, that's why I would throw them out, but probably at the end of it, not, not say yes to that. Yeah. Um, I, I think another name that I had considered, but would probably be like either uh, cheating or because I think every um, young guy would be best suited in this circumstance, but like uh, Chris Paul and uh and DeAndre Ayton is sort of like the ideal circumstances you would want a young uh, shooting wing to be surrounded by. So if he does fall that far, which I don't think he will, and, and I certainly wouldn't, but that's uh, it, Phoenix is sort of second place in um, draft Twitter, just take all of the wings possible. Um, so I, I, I think that that bears at least a little bit of mention. I know we're trying to not talk about good teams, which is what the Suns are now, um, and, and forecast, you know, development of players into good teams, but that's certainly something. Uh, Hoop Goose asks, would you mess with, mess with his form at all, and are you scared of someone trying to fix his form and maybe break it? Um, so I don't think of it as fixing his form. I think of it as solving the movement disorders he has in his lower body. Um, I think the form is generally fine. It's more the, like, the lengths that his body goes to try to make his form like an energy-efficient uh, transfer is what makes the weird stuff happen with this leg. So I wouldn't think of it in terms of like, if you just asked him to shoot, you know, what we consider textbook, like his, his the, the energy transfer would fail. And so you have to solve the muscle imbalances. You have to solve um, the, uh, the muscle tightnesses. You have to solve, you know, the real mobility work behind it. So I think that there is some danger of somebody fixing his form. I mean, people try to fix bridges form. People, like, uh, I don't think that, Generally, if you're a good shooter, you should adjust your form until a team has told you to, and that team is paying you and is willing to, you know, deal with the consequences of, of changing the form. And that, like, I generally think of, of draft uh, trainers as, as more um, uh, guides than, than people who should have a full say because they're usually hired by agents rather than being long term guys. But yeah, I do have some concern about it. But I also think that, like, his, if his agency does change his jumper, they should just, like, pull up the percentages and be like, look, this is the tinkering should be saved. Yeah, I think it's, I think his upper body is totally fine. I think the areas in, in the lower half. Um, Robel asks this question. I think uh, after this, we're going to do one more. So if, if somebody who wants to, uh, if we can get a, a final question in before we, we head on out of here. Um, Robel asks, remembering the, uh, the two one or the the weak side two one rotation where he couldn't stop the tip from the baseline. Um, will strength gain and continued improvement in positioning make up for the lack of vertical pop? 
You want to handle this uh, one first? I, yeah, I think strength gain, yes, because it will not allow him to be moved. So, like, uh, if he's in position, I, I think his position, uh, positioning is about as good as it can get. It, like, there's obviously some room for improvement, but not much. Um, so, I strength gain will help because he can't really get, uh, if he's in the correct position, he won't be, he, it's harder for him to move him off the spot. But um, I think a little bit, but I do think vertical pop is uh, a big thing that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, I think that his positioning is fantastic. Um, the reason why he gave up that corner wasn't that he wasn't positioned properly. It's because he couldn't hold that position. Um, and that Loner simply like moved him out of the way. Um, and I think that sometimes he has to make positioning adjustments and not try to hold spots that he knows he can't hold. Like, there's just not really a value in being squared off to the baseline if you know you can just be shoved out of the way instead of trying to find a, a more um, non-confrontational foot positioning that, that allows for a better change than just trying to like stand in front of somebody where you can just get knocked over. Um, I think he will get stronger. The vertical pop is very dependent on how much physical therapy happens um, because that's all energy transfer. And I think if, if you were to say that Kessler would be like a 60th percentile NBA athlete, like I would be very hard for me to keep him out of the top 10. Um, but that's about how much a team values their strength and conditioning program. Because like, to me, Kessler seems like one of the better bets to return like good playoff value. If you can solve that. Um, Are you are you comfortable answering uh, Francis's question? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to act like I'm super in on Etiwanda. I've watched a handful of their games, but they, uh, from what PD tells me, they've created a bunch of awesome team defenders. And I would say more high level team defenders is good for the NBA. Um. So, yeah. If you're in this chat right now, just uh, pull up Twitter.com and at Henry Ward. And say, tell me about Etiwanda on the timeline. Yeah, just uh, and and he will give a ringing endorsement of his own horror show playing Etiwanda, uh, in high school. Um, um, so I think that we are seeing more high schools with development and playing philosophies. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to look at the success that Montford has had specifically with with crafting team defenders. Um, um, I would say prolific prep has done a fantastic job of like creating uh, people who are capable of reading wide open space and bigs that understand how to like do Euro spacing. Like they generally have a big at, at the free throw line and one in the dunker spot to like understand how to move in small spaces. I think that what we're seeing is uh, the expectation of high schools and AAU teams playing straight up NBA basketball. Um, AAU teams have been ahead for about five years and now we're starting to see the high school teams just run, you know, full NBA sets with NBA roles and expectations where, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago, um, it was give your best player the ball until um, that stops working. Um, and now we're seeing a, a much more uh, archetypal based and uh, broad modern scheme based approach to youth development. Um, and I think that because of that, you have players like Moses Moody developing, I would say faster than he has any right to um, in his, in his two years in Montbert and Arkansas and also playing in a scheme that is very modern high school playing in, you know, a, an archetype that, that suits a player allows for, that pre-draft year, whether it's college or overseas or whatever, to be targeted towards the developing an additional context or a different context. Any uh, anything to add, real quick? Did we lose a niche? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah, sorry, my headphones died, so I had to get it. A... Totally fine. Get a new one. Um, so anything to add on the uh, the youth development philosophy idea? Um, cut out some of it because when yeah. I was recharging the headphone, but for, uh, I heard the first part, and I agree in general. A prolific rep, just a couple uh, examples of the bigs who can uh, move around well without ear spacing is uh, Mo Gaye. I watched uh, me and Henry, um, fellow Pro Insight member, uh, as uh, – we watched both of him live before he committed to Washington State, and then an Oregon kid, uh, Nate Biddle. 
Yeah. Um, and, and basically what I said was that like, we're seeing more like a, a trickle down of, of pro ball into like pro style, pro archetypes, pro understanding of, of development curves into high school. And that allows for, you know, a different approach to college instead of going to like the best school. It's like, well, I've spent four years as a off ball player. Let's try to spend one year as an on ball one and, and having a multi, having a multi contextual development pathway instead of guys who are, you know, off ball for four years of high school and then a couple of years in, in, um, uh, in college trying to find you know different circumstances that, that was yeah and, and I'm, I, I'm i don't want to say this with complete confidence but uh because i'm not as tuned into the aau scene um in high school scene but um i will say it's not as quick as uh the college to high school thing but there are I, i'm seeing more um kids have different contexts in high school and aau rather mm-hmm. than putting themselves in the same situation it's not as fast as uh compared to high school basketball and college but it's getting there in my yeah. opinion um so what do you have to plug for the people um so uh if you would like you can follow me on twitter uh my first name and last name at anish Nambury. um i don't talk about actual basketball basketball stuff uh publicly but if you would like to talk to me in the dms and stuff like that totally happy to do it most of my stuff is uh me promoting me, uh, myself and my friends oh and making jokes um, my big thing is I have a philosophy piece coming out sometime early next week on Pro Insight uh, website. Um, it's basically my uh, NBA championship roster philosophy um, and also a data science uh, with a data science focus on it because I've been dabbling into data science for the past six to nine months. And uh, I think I have found a I think I have a good idea on how to build championship rosters in the modern era and then um, a way to help identify some of those uh, championship roles, if that makes sense. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, The first one will come out hopefully early next week, and then um, the following pieces will come out uh, as the month of June progresses. Uh, Yeah, before we head out, just want to thank PD for letting me on here really appreciate it uh if you're for some reason not following this you should and uh subscribe to his patreon if you're able to wow yeah um i've seen um some behind the scenes looks at, at anisha's uh philosophy piece and it is fantastic i can't recommend that enough when it comes out i know i'm recommending something that doesn't necessarily exist in the public domain but um usually by the time that most people watch this um shout out to the real heads who are you know um who were in the chat uh, while we were live. Really appreciate you guys and have really enjoyed um, doing this as a, as a you know, um, fun thing um, as a, as a way of, of doing some interactive scouting. Um, if you uh, aren't subscribed to the YouTube channel, would appreciate that. Um, if you have any extra money uh, that you're able to donate, um, would appreciate going on the Patreon where we have uh, quite a bit of work coming up this month and last month. Um, uh, if you have a, an extra, if you have Amazon Prime, you get a free subscription to a Twitch channel. Um, if you just press that follow, it, it costs you zero dollars, and uh, Amazon pays me, which is sick. It's a real win win for both of us. Um, I have the Jalen Green piece, which I really appreciate, uh, which I really liked um, and thought it turned out really well. Um, maybe the most clips I've ever done. I think it was like 17 streamable pages, but editing that took forever. Uh, Jonathan Kaminga, if you are watching this today, when it should be up on YouTube, will be out either tomorrow or the next day, um, most of the way through that. Um, and yeah, uh, have all the video done for Kessler. I'm going to start doing the streams first and then a couple of days off um, to to do the uh, the write-ups. One, because like this is technically an early part to, uh, an early, you know, I, I do the viewing and then we do the, and then I do the writing. So I think this makes more sense. I know it's difficult to not have... Um, to not have like my full opinion, but, but you know, and then to follow along. But I think that, uh, I think that it's easier for me, um, because then I can get more of these out and just trail behind on the writing. Um, uh, because yeah, this is, this has been a, a wonderful thing for me and I really appreciate, uh, you guys all joining in. Um, so yeah, um, read the Jalen Green piece, read the coming up piece, come out in a couple of days, watch the streams, um, subscribe if you can to, uh, to YouTube. Um, everybody's got, you know, the YouTube subscribe money. If you have the Patreon money, I totally get it. If you don't, everything is always free. 
Uh, thank you, Anish. Uh, you no, know, you guys' uh, donations uh, help pay for the guests um, because I, you know, it's important to me that nobody works for free ever in basketball. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, go harass Henry Ward about Etawanda. Have a wonderful night.